Greetings and good evening to Mystery Babylon News Radio on March 24th, 2013. Tonight's topic is Unmasking the Jesuits. I feel it is very important to understand who and why the Jesuits were founded. Why? Two months ago, we covered the Council of Trent and the Counter-Reformation. You can find this in the archives at Mystery Babylon Radio. Two months ago, we did not have a Jesuit Pope, which is a very interesting turn of events. would like to play a six-minute audio clip on the Jesuits by Chris Pinto of Noise of Thunder Radio. His website is noiseofthunder.com. His last two broadcasts have been on the Jesuits. Strongly recommend listening to these broadcasts. Again, that is noiseofthunder.com. That's noiseofthunder, all one word, dot com. This six-minute clip is an introduction to the broadcast. Thanks for stopping by, and now here is the clip. And as we move forward, I'll talk about the influence of the Jesuits in this, because this is what they're known for. They're known for setting forth their perverse and corrupt philosophies whereby they justify the work of evil. In fact, in the Middle Ages, it was at one point uh, uncovered that the Jesuits had set forth a system of philosophy whereby they could teach someone to violate all of the Ten Commandments of God. They had worked it out philosophically so they could convince somebody that violating all of the commandments of God was justifiable under certain circumstances. This is what they're known for. And as we move forward and we talk about their influence in Darwinism and in postmodernism, you'll see that the normalization of evil in America today is not an accident. It has been by design. But I want to go back to this point about the authority of the Pope and what Napoleon said here about how the, the aim of the Jesuit order is the power to control the world by the volition of a single man. I was speaking at a conference in uh, Des Moines, Iowa, some time ago, and I was speaking about the Jesuits and the Counter-Reformation, and after the conference was over, uh, a woman came over to speak to me, and she had her two college-age uh, children with her, and she said, I wanted to talk to you because both of my children attend Jesuit universities. And one of them, the girl, was attending Creighton University. And it's spelled, it, 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 to me, it's always looked like Crichton, C-R-E-I-G-H-T-O-N, Crichton. It's actually pronounced Creighton, Creighton University. And it's a Jesuit university. And she said that, that there, this is what she said to me, that they make you take so many theology courses there that you end up, by default, with essentially a minor in theology, whether you want one or not. And she said she was a Protestant, and in her theology class, the Jesuit who teaches the class was telling her that whether she knows it or not, she is under the authority of the Pope, that the Pope is the head of of the church, he's the head of all Christians, whether Catholic or Protestant or whoever they are, that he is in charge of them and that she is under his authority whether she realizes that or not, even though she was a Protestant. And of course she related to me that she was very troubled by this. Now I have to tell you, brethren, this is, uh, I'm recording this in the year of our Lord 2012 and we're about to go into the year 2013 uh, this is the month of October, just so you know. I was very surprised when she told me this less than a month ago. I did not think the Jesuits in America would be that forward about this doctrine. But apparently they are, according to her testimony. But her testimony is that her Jesuit professor at the Jesuit University, Creighton University, is telling her, that she is under the authority of the Pope, whether she knows it or not. So remember, brethren, these issues about papal authority, they're not really hundreds of years in the past. I mean, they are. They are part of the past that our country and our society comes from. Nevertheless, these issues continue 
to be important, and they have everything to do with what is driving the history of the world today. And that's the reason why, it's an important reason why I'm giving this audio presentation to help inform and awaken Christians in our country, especially evangelical Christians. Bible-believing Christians who fear God and who love the Lord Jesus Christ and who want to earnestly contend for the faith. We need to recognize our enemy, the enemy of the gospel. As the Bible says concerning the works of Satan, that we ought not to be ignorant of his wiles and how he works. All right, let's go on to another quote here. Here's one from the Marquis de Lafayette. Lafayette, who famously fought alongside George Washington in the American Revolution. And after the revolution was over, Lafayette said, quote, It is my opinion that if the liberties of this country, the United States of America, are destroyed, it will be by the subtlety of the Roman Catholic Jesuit priests, for they are the most crafty, dangerous enemies to civil and religious liberty. Lafayette went on to say that the Jesuits had been responsible for nearly all the wars of Europe. Why? Because over and over again, they were stirring up wars. Uh, they, they tried to invade England through the Spanish Armada in 1588. They tried the gunpowder plot of 1605, where they were going to blow up the British Parliament and set up a new Catholic government uh, in place of King James I. Uh, they tried to bring back the Inquisition under King Charles I. That's why Charles ultimately got his head cut off. Then they tried a different tactic through King James II to open the door to the Inquisition again in England. And that's when the English drove James II off the throne and William and Mary came in. And from that point, the English said, no more will they allow a Catholic to sit on the throne of England. And it's why the laws in America, back when America was under English authority, why Catholics were forbidden from being involved in government in the early colony. Welcome. Welcome back to the, uh, to the broadcast. <clears throat> Very interesting history. And uh, it's one of the reasons for the broadcast tonight is to bring out some of the uh, interesting points of history that has been overlooked or not taught. And uh, one of the things that I want to uh, bring this uh, discussion is, uh, is back to 1776. But listen, now, first of all, I, I, I have uh, a, a guest tonight. My guest is Tom Fress, and uh, he is currently reading uh, uh, Ecclesiastical Megalomania by John W. Robbins. And, uh, uh, and it's one of the reasons for this broadcast is uh, some of the things that uh, John W. Robbins is discussing uh, are going along right with, uh, uh, with uh, the book that I've been uh, reading is, uh, and the book that I've been reading and kind of researching is All Roads Lead to Rome. Uh, uh, no, excuse me. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Washington in the Lap of Rome in 1888 by Justin Fulton. So anyway, Tom, uh, uh, welcome to the broadcast. Yeah, good evening, Walt. Good evening to your listeners. Yes. Um, well, you know, uh, uh, it's some very interesting history there, and, and um, Chris. Oh, absolutely, Chris Pinto's great, man. He uh, he knows what's going on. I highly recommend his program, and uh, on uh, Noise of Thunder Radio, and uh, he's trying to tell the truth, the truth that has been lost in this country. Critical history. Yeah. Trying to renew, trying to renew the knowledge of Protestantism in this country, true biblical Oriental Protestantism. Well, on it's, it's nearly lost in this country today. Well, on on those uh, on those points, uh, on your last Friday's broadcast, I, when I was listening, uh, I have uh, I have a, a four minute segment here that uh, that you were talking uh, and uh, right out of the out of uh, John Ro John W. Uh, Robbins' book, and uh, so uh, right now I'd like to uh, start that and play that. Yes. No, excuse me, excuse me. Excuse me, I hit the wrong button again. 
that's uh, live radio. Why do you why why do you think the Roman Catholic Church fought for centuries to get control of Protestant England, a Protestant England that insisted on religious liberty as long as she could? She insisted that everybody have the right to worship God according to the dictates of their conscience and according to their own faiths. And the Roman Catholic Church abused that liberty. They used the liberty of religion to organize themselves and to try to overthrow the Protestant government so that it could absolutely erase religious liberty in England and make it Catholic. That defines the entire history of England. England was probably the most embattled country since the Protestant Reformation. And that's why that's why England finally had to suppress Roman Catholicism. It became apparent that there was no appeasing the Roman Pontiff, no appeasing Roman Catholics in England. They were simply unrelentingly going to do whatever it took, no matter how long it took, to overthrow the Protestant government of England and replace it with a papal dictatorship. And England just did what she had to do to survive. Now, has the United States been embattled? This so-called Protestant nation, America, has it, has it been so embattled with Roman Catholics? Why? No. Roman Catholics have patiently and quietly and studiously and in, in, inevitably have kept marching this country closer and ever so closer, gradually, without awakening the Protestant spirit in this country, they have led this country to a Catholic existence, a Catholic reality. And there's never been a whimper, especially in my generation. True, there were many books written in the in the 17th and 18th, uh, 17 and 1800s, warning America. We've read them here on Inquisition Update, and I've got a whole library more of them sitting. I'm looking right at them right now as I speak. A whole library of books talking about this but they're hardly known about in this country anymore. That's why our generation is totally ignorant to what really ails this country. America is no less embattled by Roman Catholicism in our government as was England. We're just not aware of it. We don't identify it for what it is. <clears throat> and that... Uh takes me back to uh, what the, the statistics that I've said over many broadcasts here now. If you go back to 1776, 99% uh, of, the, of the colonies were Protestant, and there was less than 1% Catholic. And um, what I really feel, uh, and not only feel, but you can see that they have reversed the numbers. Comments, Tom? Yes, well, I don't have those statistics in front of me, and I'm not sure they're even available. But uh, but I can tell you from my own experiences, both in doing Inquisition Update and also lengthy nightly discussions on amateur radio over a period of 10 years, uh, that Protestantism, true biblical Protestantism, now be, it hardly exists in this country. Now, let me define for your listeners what Protestantism is. Not only is it but the belief in the authorized King James Version of the Bible, the true Word of God, the unpolluted Word of God, but it also, uh, Protestant is also characterized by the reality that the papacy is the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist. And as I've said on your broadcast before, and I say on my broadcast so many times, there are multitudes of people in this country that call themselves Protestant, but are not. They simply do not know who the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist is. 
the Protestant Reformation was literally fueled with that knowledge. There would have been no Protestant Reformation had they not rebelled and protested against the biblical Antichrist, the Pope of Rome. And, and if your listeners will read any of the writings of the, of the true Protestant reformers, they'll all, to the man, tell you that the Pope fulfills all the prophecies in Scripture regarding Antichrist. And there's no other candidate on the earth that fulfills all the prophecies regarding the, the Antichrist in the Bible. They're waiting for an Antichrist to come way off in the future. The, the whole every, the whole so-called Protestant community in, in this country believes that Antichrist won't come until the distant future. And how deceived they are if they only knew what the Protestant reformers truly believe. And in this country, as you well know, during the colonial period, the Catholics represented only 1% of the population. The vast majority, 99%, were Protestant. And, and they, they, outlawed Protestant, they outlawed Catholicism in the country. Catholics couldn't practice their religion. They couldn't occupy uh, positions in the government. They couldn't vote. And uh, it was simply because of the history that the Roman Catholic Church uh, tried to overthrow the Protestant government. They didn't want to repeat in the colonies of what had taken place in Protestant England. And uh, nowadays, because of the lack of the knowledge of what true Protestantism is, the, the, the tides have turned. There, there aren't, but I can't believe that there would be more than a few percentage points of, of the percentage of the population of this country have any idea that the papacy is the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist of the Bible. So they can't call themselves Protestants. They better call themselves Catholic than Protestant. Well, what, what I think is very interesting with the turn of events and the, now that there's a Jesuit pope, um, I think it's very clear. If, if, if The reason why I came to the one, less than 1% of the people, uh, 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 how the figures have flip-flopped, is because all you'd have to know is what the Jesuits, why they were founded, and, and, and when they were founded. And they were founded to counter the Reformation in 1540. So with the, with the turn of events, with a Jesuit pope, it shows you that they are right out in the open. They realize that the general public, that the world is deceived and they do not know what a Jesuit in the gold of a Jesuit. And Tom, add to that, what is the goal of the Jesuits? Well, the goal of the Jesuits is to destroy the Protestant Reformation, to destroy Protestantism, and to make the world Catholic, and to seat the Pope of their choosing uh, on, on, as a governor of the world in, on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. That was the purpose for all the crusades of the Roman Catholic Church, to capture the Holy Land, to capture Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the apple of the papacy's eyes. That's where Jesus walked the streets of Jerusalem. And the papacy regards itself as the vicar or the replacement of Jesus Christ on the earth. That's what his title means. And, and, and Rome is never going to be satisfied until she rules from Jerusalem. And uh, the Protestant... Re or the... Uh, the uh, Protestant Reformation was fueled, like I said, with the knowledge that the papacy was the Antichrist. Protestants don't want Jerusalem to be governed, or the world to be governed, by the Pope, the biblical Antichrist. And, and so they preached the papacy is the Antichrist, and, and that the Roman Catholic Church is the synagogue of Satan. That's true biblical Protestantism. And they preached it all over the world, and they literally converted all of Europe. The papacy was nearly destroyed with the knowledge. Everybody knew that the papacy was the Antichrist. They told it from Scripture and from history. But that knowledge is lost today. And the Jesuit order was created in 1540 by a man by the name of Ignatius Loyola, a military man and a, an occultist. He was a member of the Spanish Alumbrados or the Spanish Illuminati. 
And he, he's, he literally determined that he was, by any means necessary, to conquer the world for the Pope. And that's what the Jesuits are. And to, 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 to stop that end is, is to renounce their Jesuitism. If a, if a Jesuit stops fighting the, the, the Protestant Reformation, if he stops engaging in what we know as the Counter-Reformation, he ceases to be a Jesuit. The Counter-Reformation is the most deadly enemy of the Pope, of the papal goal to rule the world from Mount Moriah and Jerusalem. The Protestant Reformation is the most lethal enemy of the papacy. And history has already proven that it nearly destroyed Roman Catholicism. The Pope was nearly a beggar uh, after the Protestant Reformation. No, no king or government on the earth would obey him anymore. But now in our generation, we have a full revival of the papacy to world dominance and power, especially in Washington, D.C. The Jesuits have been kicked out of every nation on the planet except the United States of America. That was my... And the Jesuits have literally used the United States of America as a home base for their global operations. They've taken control of our government. They've taken control of our military. They've taken control of our banks, our politics, the whole thing. And for, uh, nearly since uh, the founding of this country, they've used it for one purpose, and that is to restore the temporal power of the Pope, not only in America, but all over the world. And they did it with... Protestants living in this country. It's amazing when one really begins to comprehend and understand. They did it from Protestant USA. They couldn't do it from Protestant England. Protestant England fought the Jesuits tooth and nail. But not America. Not America. We've, we've accommodated the Jesuits. They stroll through the halls of Washington, D.C., and the Congress, and the White House, and the Supreme Court. Without resistance, there's nary a negative word said about the Jesuit order. But you heard what Chris Pinto said. They said every American, every American comes under the authority of the papacy. And he knows exactly what he's talking about because I've read the same information. The papacy claims that everyone who is baptized of water comes under his jurisdiction. But not only that, even the heathen come under the jurisdiction of the papacy because he is the vicar of Christ, so he says. And what does the scripture tell us? The earth is mine and the fullness thereof. And that's how the papacy views the earth. Now, Roman Catholics in America are not familiar with this. But uh, we have to understand that American Catholicism is unique in all the Catholic world. They grew up in what was a Protestant nation. They had to, they had to uh, continue their religion without awakening another Protestant Reformation in this country. So Catholics in this country are not really privy and not well educated about what Roman Catholicism really is. But you ask any Catholic anywhere else in the world, and they'll tell you what what the goal of, of the papacy is, and it's to rule the world as Christ Vicar on Earth. And nothing will get in their way. Nothing will stop them. And especially not if the Protestants remain fast asleep to their Protestant heritage. I'd like to make a quote uh, from the planned destruction of America by James W. Uh, Warner. Uh, he contends that America is not failing but being deliberately destroyed by subversive forces from within. Quote out of his book. The American people are being taken on one of the longest Trojan horse rides of history. We are being duped by our leaders who have been conspired against us. The declining American standard of living has been planned from the beginning. It is the result of planning at the very highest levels of America. A plan to fail, a plan to create insecurity and uncertainty, a plan to make the American people serfs in the new world order. And at, right at the top of this is, is we have to look at the Jesuits and the Jesuit influence on education. And another thing that uh, has been noticed, and you've, I, I think you've uh, recognized it, even uh, TV announcers have come out and boldly said that they're proud that they have a Jesuit education. 
They're no longer, uh, uh, in other words, in, in other words, that I really feel that when somebody comes out like like this, this look at it like this. Uh, let's go to Seattle University, which is a Jesuit university, and just take an example and walk down the aisleway, hallways of, of a Jesuit university. Those young people don't understand what is, what's happening. Why? I mean, look at myself as an example. I was raised a Lutheran. I got no church history. I knew I, I knew little to none. Uh, uh, little to none of, of Martin Luther. One of the reasons, too, for this broadcast tonight is uh, is is unmasking the Jesuits and uh, and and communism. Uh, it this this was a very very uh, um, and, you know uh, you know everybody uh, has uh, uh, especially a baby boomer like myself. I'm 68 years old and a baby boomer. And uh, and all I've ever heard is war, and then the, uh, the war movies, and and I was ready to go in '62 when I went into the military because I was ready to fight communism. Where did this boogeyman come from? Tom, could you could you relate just a little bit before I start with the Jesuits and McCarthyism? Could you relate a little bit how Catholicism and communism relate to each other? Well, yes. After all. Uh... Marx and Lenin and Engels and as Stalin were all trained by the Jesuits. Roman Catholic, or excuse me, communism was perfected by the Jesuits in the Paraguayan reductions, the Indians, the Guarani Indians from Paraguay. They they perfected the communist system, and they they imported it into Russia through the Bolshevik Revolution, and they did this in preparation for a conflict that they were trying to create to restore Catholicism to Europe. And so they had to have this boogeyman up in the Soviet Union, this communist menace, to justify the rise of, of, of Nazi fascism and the rise of Adolf Hitler, who would engulf the entire European continent and even the United States against this, this red menace. And out of it simply was conducted a Holy Roman Inquisition against the Protestant Reformation. Now, we, we, we hear talk all the time about the Holocaust. Six million Jews, they were killed. Well, they were heretics. They weren't, they weren't members of the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that uh, their replacement theology doctrine, which says the Jews rejected Christ, and Roman Catholicism is now the one holy, true Christian church created by Christ himself, and that Peter was the first apostle, and that the Roman Catholic Church has now replaced the Jews. So now they have the obligation to evangelize and to conquer the world in Christ's name. In order to justify that conquering, there has to be a conflict. The Pope can't just go about running crusades anymore because there's too much negative history associated with the crusades. So they implanted... Uh, Jesuit communism into the Soviet Union, and they 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 rose up uh, Adolf Hitler in Europe, and then during the battle, during the conflict, the Second World War, Protestant Germany was destroyed, the Jews were destroyed, and so were the Orthodox, uh, the Greek and Russian Orthodox. <laughs> That was the, those people were the targets of the Second World War. Sure, a lot of Catholics died. Let, let me explain that in, in a way here, Tom. Yes. Uh, you see, they, when they divided that, uh, they, when they divided Germany, they divided it up into East and West. Eastern Germany was predominantly that was that was the, where the Protestant Reformation exploded, mm -hmm. and and East Germany was predominantly Protestant, and and, and uh, West Germany was predominantly Catholic. And I just learned this last week that, uh, like, 50% uh, <clears throat> of the of the German army were 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 were, were, um, were Catholic. But so so when they so when they went east, well, what's even more important than that? All of Hit, Hitler's hierarchy were Roman Catholic. Yes, virtually yes. all of them, and so were the leaders of the Nazi SS. <laughs> Yeah, that's that, that's correct. The yeah. the point that I'm trying to make is when when they uh, 
uh, when they when they marched east to Stalingrad, the, most of the army was Protestant. Now, but listen, it was they they changed the word from Inquisition to war. Yeah. Because they're the ones they're the ones that 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 uh, fueled the communist uh, uh, communist uh, Russia against the fa the fascists. And and if we hadn't if if the America hadn't supported Russia in the land lease, they would it wouldn't it have fell flat. Yeah. They wanted as much destruction. So when so when that's the reason they held our troops back and and put a wall on East Germany and 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 made the Protestant East Germany communist because the only difference between communism and and fascism in Germany was religion. There was no I mean communism in Russia, I mean it, it was it was I mean they they were they almost destroyed the orthodox church. Yeah. So the the second world war can be described this way that it was a holy roman crusade against protestants, jews and orthodox but it was conducted under the cover of politics. Right. And, and that explains all the wars of the world. Right. They're all religious wars, Walt. When you get to study them, they're always every, religious every. wars. And the Jesuits foment them all. And out of every war, they've conquered what the Roman Catholic Church has determined are heretics, Protestants, Jews, and Orthodox. Yeah. <clears throat> I want it's to, reality. This isn't this isn't blind assertion. No. This documented history now. We're beginning to understand what has driven all these wars. And it's from the help of God's holy word, the Bible. Revelation chapter seventeen and eighteen. Once you understand Revelation chapter seventeen and eighteen, then history becomes understandable. In in one uh, goal of this broadcast is to is to get somebody we're not here for popularity or for numbers. Uh, it is to get uh, some to people to research themselves. And so, as we're running out of time, uh, there's if you do a Google search on on a Catholic Cold War, a Catholic Cold War by Patrick McNamara. Uh, it's a very, in other words, and the, on the front cover is Edmund A. Walsh and the politics of American anti-communism. Now. I got off the, the the book is on the internet on uh, on Google. I want to read just a, a paragraph that uh, Bill Mac McNamara uh, said. He's the, he's the one that wrote the book, and the book is on Edmund A. Walsh, a, a Catholic, and the title is a Catholic Cold War because you see the Cold War was brought on by Rome, and there wasn't there the Rome, uh, Russia was never a threat. That's the reason why Jimmy Carter, why they didn't let us go over there during the Olympics. They didn't want to see the condition that Russia was in. Back in, I'll, I, I want to tell you just briefly, back in 1990, <clears throat> 1981, I listened to a lecture on Stuart Crane. Now, he's been deceased since. But in 1981, he, he made a trip to Russia. There was only 29 gas stations in Russia. There's a checkpoint every 25 miles. Now, I'll tell you, I, the next uh, years that I, I tried to disprove what I had read, but I have, I have talked to people from that have actually traveled and verified everything I learned on that lecture. I mean, uh, Russia, is, Russia has been suppressed right from the, right from the 1917, from the Bolshevik Re Revolution. But now, now listen, I want to read this paragraph because uh, there's an Edmund Walsh. See, Edmund Walsh was a Jesuit at Georgetown University. Now, here's his credentials. This is by Bill Mac McNamara. He said, quickly realizing what a formal task it would be to consider Walsh's career as a whole, I chose instead to concentrate here on his anti-communism. After he returned from Russia in January 1924, Walsh spent the next four decades warning the American people about the moral and political threat that Soviet communism posed to the international community. By late 1952, when a stroke ended his public career, his anti-communist campaign amounted to four books and a dozens of articles on the Soviet Union. 
as well as nearly 2,000 lectures on this subject. No other Catholic anti-communist could claim such a record. Now, uh, Walsh was a, 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 a Everybody has, has studied some history. Not in, I'm, I'm sure some of the younger people are not going. This is not, but it's on the internet. You, you, all you have to do is do a, 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 a Google search on McCarthyism. You know, you know, one, it, it, to understand how President Obama's administration may fit into the Vatican's agenda, it is, I think, necessary to cover briefly the record of Marxism in this country, since our current president is so often accused of having socialist are communist leanings. One of the darkest periods in American history was the McCarthy era in which a, a modern-day inquisition was set up to search out communists who were effectively known as the political heretics of the time. What few people today know, however, is that Senator Joseph McCarthy was directly influenced by the Jesuit order to begin his political movement that would operate with all the unreasonable zealousness that Rome's historic inquisition was known for. It goes on in this, this article, this is an article by uh, Chris Pinto. British author Avrian Manhattan described the covert op activities that were taking place just a few months before Carthur began his fearful crusade. Cardinal Spellman was summoned to Rome by the Pope, with whom he had repeated and prolonged private sessions. Although given rise to sharp speculation, it remained a well-guarded secret. The new Catholic Secretary of U.S. Navy, Francis, Francis Matthews, strangely enough, soon afterwards began unusual active, act, active contacts with the prominent American Catholics. Among these, it was, it was Father Walsh, Jesuit Vice President of Georgetown University, Cardinal Spellman, the head of the American Legion, the leaders of the Catholic war, war veterans and with Senator McCarthy, the arch criminal senator who, upon the advice of a Catholic priest, was, was just beginning his famous campaign, which, to, which was to half paralyze the U.S. for some years to come. That was a quote from uh, Avery Man Manhattan in his book. Uh, uh, and, and Joe McCarthy was himself was educated by the Jesuits at Marquette University. It is said that his Jesuit was a mentor named Edmund A. Walsh, a man known as an anti-communist whose influence seemed to have woefully infected his famous pupil. By the time McCarthy's career as, as the American in Inquisitor was over, he would be reduced to bitterness, humiliation, and alcohol, alcoholism. And eventually, I mean, uh, you know, he's you know, and, and, and then, and then uh, uh, he was a later, you know, vilified and, and, and made out as some, some kind of a, some kind of a, a, a wacko. But the thing that I found interesting in my research is this: I found all kinds of pictures of McCarthy. I only found two pictures of Walsh. Walsh is kind of a a, a, a figure that's been, uh, 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 you know. And, and it's amazing his his past. It, it, I, it, in other words, his involvement with government. Just listen to, to, to a little bit of his biography here. The book is the first. This book is the first biography in 42 years of the priest and educator, whom historians have called the most important anti-communist in the country, Edmund A. Walsh, as dean of Georgetown College and founder in 1919 of his School of Foreign Service is one of the most influential Catholic figures of the 20th century. Soon after the birth of the Bolshevik state, he directed the papal relief mission in the, in the Soviet Union, starting a lifelong immersion in, in Soviet and communist affairs. In other words, he was going back and forth right from the beginning you know, <clears throat> of, of, of the revolution. He also established a Jesuit college in Baghdad and served as a consultant to the Nuremberg War Crimes Tri Tribunal <clears throat> and, 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 he, and became one of Truman's most trusted advisors on Soviet strategy. He wrote four books in, in dozens of articles. I read that. But another thing I, I, I found, interesting side note on Walsh. This is what President Dwight D. Eisenhower 
uh, sent a letter to Georgetown University when, when Walsh died in, in 1956, which read in part, The death of Father Walsh is a grievous loss to the society in which he served so many years to the educational and religious life of the United States and to the free people of the Western world. For four decades, he was vigorous and inspiring champion of freedom for mankind and independence for nations. At every call to duty, all his energy of leadership and wisdom and counsel were devoted to the service of the United States. I mean, it's very interesting when you start reading about this man, the fact that he, he mentored uh, uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower, uh, uh, and, that, and, and also he, 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 was a, a, he, he was a good friend of, of, of Truman. I mean, he was, he was around American politics continually. And, any, and, and, and that is one of the reasons why we have been at, 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 we have the, the, the war machine that we've had and, and, and been at war, a continuous war. Comments, Tom? Yes, Edmund Walsh was a Jesuit priest from the most powerful Jesuit university in this country. He was involved in military propaganda. He raised up McCarthy uh, to, to, to start the Cold War and the and the uh the uh raise united states uh, uh suspicion against communism and, and kicked off the cold war and he was he was literally you know trying to foment uh another war and uh mccarthy w was simply a tool of of uh, edmund walsh and, and, and started the inquisition against uh, so-called communists in this country just to raise American concern about communism when it was a creation of the Jesuits to start with. It was simply to exacerbate uh, this country's involvement in foreign wars. And it was very effective. And he even set at the terms of... of uh, of armistice after the war, it was it was a it was a complete out in the open orchestration of Georgetown University of America's involvement in the war, and and the fact the that the Roman he... Catholic Church conducted another Holy Roman Crusade with American blood, sweat, and tears, and money, and that's the... it's incredible. And that's the Trojan horse that uh, yeah, James Trojan, Warner was talking about. The Trojan about. horse that James Warner was talking about is the Jesuit order. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, it it's, is. And, and uh, you know, it, you know, it, and the thing of it is, it, it's a uh, the, the truth of it is, I we don't have the figures, but as as I get around and talk in the community, and as I talk with people, I realize, like myself, there's very few people that understand the facts on the ground tell you what really happened i mean it's 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 once you see this they once you see it i mean if the books that that they just don't teach it they teach uh they teach uh you know ratio studiorum and all the university all the universe. yes liberal arts everything you know everything to occupy a person's mind so they don't have time to read the bible and they don't have time to read true history there's no nobody has the means by which to reassemble a, a true understanding of what's going on in the world. It, it is absolutely imperative that the world never discover what the Roman Catholic Church has really been in history. Well, say, listen, Tom, we're out of time, t time here, and I've got a little uh, uh, ending here on the end of the broadcast. So, listen, Tom, thanks for coming and. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think it was a it, this was a very enlightening for me, and I hope it was for the for, for the people that have been listening. Yeah. So, w thanks for listening, and and we'll see you next week.